I am here both as a filmmaker and technologist um, and activist. And gender is not exactly the right word. Sort of the through line with all of my work is uh, consent and looking at sexual violence, sexual empowerment, how we talk about sexuality in general, um, and using the word consent. And it's a word that has meaning to us now, but when I started doing this work 10 years ago, it was something people didn't understand. And actually choosing the language to reach audiences was so key. I'm gonna show you a gruesome slide, so brace yourselves for really a disgusting era in our country. I'm kidding, but um, this was basically what sexuality looked like for a lot of young people growing up under the Bush administration. Coming up as a young activist and as a young woman trying to navigate uh, what does it mean to be feminist or sexually empowered um, under the aspects of this whole very whitewashed culture of purity balls, um, a fetish fetishization of virginity. Um, this is a little bit of a PG-13 talk, so hi. <laughs> I should have warned you. Uh, anyway, we'll move past that slide and ignore some other details. But it was a, a really, like, it's a really disturbing, confusing time. So young people were not given actual legitimate sexuality education to keep them safe, to teach them about their autonomy, what they're allowed to want, what they're allowed to say no to. And that was all thanks to our good friend George W. Bush, who insisted on abstinence-only education, which is no education, um, adding the rise of the internet and pornography, and it is another R-rated slide coming up. But it's a big mess. It was a big mess for young people. What that inspired for me as a young person was for me to make my first film born of personal experience with a sexual assault and um, trying to investigate what happened, why it happened, what to call it, and really ask these, these kind of basic questions, but what is a yes and what is a no? Who gets to decide? And really, where is the line of consent? Um, it's a really dangerous environment to not give young people accurate information about sexuality, um, to use shaming mechanisms to silence victims. We're in an incredible moment now, but 10 years ago I was told by everyone that no one would care about one person's story. My story was sort of questioned relentlessly, um, and I knew that I wasn't alone, of course, and I also knew that I wanted to push it beyond victim stories to a place of what is the world we want to imagine? What is a sexuality or a language that feels empowering, that feels like something we want to work towards? So it's a 25-minute film, and we had amazing, tremendous impact. I had to sort of slog through a lot of funders, many of them male, saying to me, I don't really know if you have an audience. Um, I'm still seeing royalty checks as a 25-minute educational film, meaning that we went all over the country. We went all over the world with this film. And we asked a simple question to young people to step beyond sharing a story of harm, which is really important, but to say, what do you want? What do you envision? Where is your line? So young people said, my line is being seen as a sexual being, not a sexual object. Uh, a, a young man said, I don't know as a male, I didn't know I was allowed to have one. So it was kind of the early beginnings of starting to understand how toxic masculinity is really harmful to both women and men and queer people, um, and how dangerous it is for men to feel that they have to live in this toxic man box of expectations. Um, and the last one I like is wherever I decide it is, not you, my parents, my religion, or my culture. So really giving, we started, so this was early technology, this was 2009. Uh, using blogs, using Twitter, really simple, using stickers. And this was the data that I collected. This was sort of me taking the temperature of how young people are experiencing sexuality and what they want to change. So the next part of the journey was a bit, is when good things happened in the government. Not perfect, but the eight years under our friends. Um, and we had a vice president. <laughs> it's going to keep watching. We had a vice president who co-authored and authored the Violence Against Women Act. So what Vice President Biden did was create the Apps Against Abuse Challenge. So we used to have, we don't have it anymore, an Office on Violence Against Women that was dedicated to caring about what happens to girls and women. So that was eradicated the first week of uh, Trump's term, of course. Um, but before that, we also had an Office of Science and Tech Policy that was actually under... Um, 
Biden and Obama, um, really innovative. And so they decided to ask regular citizens um, to see if there was a way to reduce sexual violence with young people using technology. So I've always used technology. I'm not uh, a coder. Um, I was a little bit more of a tech utopian about eight years ago. That's completely gone now. I'm much more of a realist and an art utopian. The challenge was, can you make an app for young people to reduce sexual violence? Very big, very broad. My initial thought was, no, because I'm a filmmaker. I don't know how to make a, an app. But then I realized, wait, I've just been touring the country, listening to young people, re reacquainting myself. At the time, I was maybe like six years out of college. But you know, what are young people going through? Where are they intersecting with harm? How do they speak to each other? I learned just from that right off the bat, folks go to each other. So how can we empower peer-to-peer -peer networks, especially around sexuality and sex ed, unless you have incredible parents or incredible sexuality education. We're all getting information from each other or uh, the internet. So we um, brought together a very small team um, and it was queer led, it was survivor led, and it was feminist technology. So who is making the tech matters for a lot of reasons. We built a technology that was inclusive of everyone's experience in terms of sexuality. We made a safety tool around sexual violence that did not connect you to the police. We do not believe the police are safe um, for many populations. We use language that was inclusive of all kinds of experience. We used harm reduction models, uh, which is essentially meeting people where you are. Um, so if this is a tool for 18 and 19 and 20 year olds, um, and it's Friday night at three o'clock in the morning, I'm going to assume like all of your peers, you're out drinking. That's not a reason for you to be a victim of sexual violence. That's nothing to judge you on. That's just exactly where you are as a 21-year-old. So the tool's simple. Um, you pre-populate it in advance, um, and we got a lot of colleges to adopt it and encourage people to use it. You pick six people uh, max, minimum three people, and this is your circle, this is your crew, this is your group of friends. And you're doing this on a Tuesday afternoon because your RA in college told you to do it. You're not doing it at four o'clock in the morning on a Saturday trying to get home or out of a situation. So it's safety planning without scariness. And it's three pre-programmed functions. Um, come and get me, I need help with a GPS. Call me, I need an interruption. Or the third one is I need to talk. Um, the interruption, we called that sort of the bad date button, like get me out of here. Um, and we had highly vetted uh, national hotlines, um, consent and science-based sexuality education, and a custom hotline. So if you did want to put the police in, you could. If you wanted to put campus security, you could. If you were living in another country, you could put a number in there. So by opening it up, we were able to really spread, and I'll talk about where we've been. But I use this slide because you know we love bells and whistles, the media loves a new tech tool, and this is like, remember eight years ago when people in the government believed in science and technology. Um, so everyone got excited because we won the White House prize, and they're like, oh my god, this new tool, it's gonna end rape. And I would say there is no silver bullet. This is a multifaceted problem. Technology is not the only solution, it's certainly not the solution. We believe in empowering peers. We, and so I used every opportunity to get in the media to really talk and use it as a public education platform, which I think is really powerful. Um, we also talked about the dangers of um, collecting data and how we refuse to do that. So that's why I'm a millionaire, um, because I make human rights tech and I don't sell my data. Um, so yeah, thank you tech world who doesn't care about the double bottom line. So we did have incredible impact and we're still going. We have 350,000 users in 36 countries. Um, we made a version uh, with Indian partners for New Delhi. Uh, we worked with military. We are now um, partnering with Article 19 um, Freedom of Expression Organization and The Guardian Project, a human rights uh, development shop to go fully encrypted, which means you can't hack into it and it's safe, no data collection, and uh, create versions for Mexican women journalists working in Mexico. So when we build that, which is very easily adaptable, um, well, thank you, thanks. Um, so, you know, thank goodness that people do give money to people like the Guardian Project who are taking over our technology, and really thank you to the women who risk their lives every day being journalists in Mexico. Um, truly uh, unbelievable circumstances. So, so that was sort of my wild run in the tech industry. Um, where all you have to do is say the word gender in a tech space and everyone thinks you're like a revolutionary. Uh, 
giving talks was like much easier in that space. I'm like, women, queer, and they're like, oh my god. Um, it was like amazing. Uh, not anymore, but here we are with a more sophisticated, interesting audience. Oh yeah, I was supposed to say, what is the story of your technology that matters? Also with Circle of Six, we were creating a new narrative that wasn't around stranger danger and more around empowering your networks. So, um, okay, so moving on to Roll Red Roll. Uh, which is hard to say, but not really. If you do it with a southern accent or if you say it like you play football, it makes sense. It's a football chant. Um, and it is a true crime documentary looking at the Steubenville, Ohio rape case, which was a story that broke in 2012. I mean, it was really the first rape case to go viral because it came at this insane intersection when everyone was using social media, but they didn't really know how it worked. They didn't really understand that it was public. So it was a case where you could actually piece and see what happened from multiple perspectives because of the trail of social media evidence um, and because a very incredible woman who was a blogger and a social media expert was snooping around at the right time and dug up all the data. So I'm going to show you all um, a trailer. There's pressure to get these kids guilty. And even if they're guilty, they'll blame that they didn't do this and that. I hope, you know, that the truth comes out. When I first read the story, there wasn't a lot of substance to the article. Two high school football players had been charged just a couple of paragraphs about these two boys and that was it. I thought, this is nuts because that town is so entrenched in their football team. This is big news. So that's when I started snooping around. I had never seen a case constructed like this. That many people who have some information. This was a sexual assault with teenagers, and the cell phones told the story. We had photos. We had 400,000 text messages. It was on Twitter, actually. Song of the night, rape me. Some people deserve to be peed on. Just the complete lack of empathy, that was what was so frightening. I mean, it was all out there. You're always gonna get two very different sides, but this was just at another level. We didn't know exactly what happened, but we knew there was a lot of defensiveness about it. Uh, I just didn't understand it at all, I, because I don't think it's something that doesn't occur in other cities and states and counties all over. If teachers knew about it, if coaches knew about it, if a principal knew about it, if parents knew about it, why was nothing done about that? And the question was, is this football town, you know, putting its daughters at risk by protecting its sons in a situation like this? Yay, thanks. Um, this is a long form documentary, it took four years to make. Uh, we premiered at Tribeca, some of our incredible supporters are in this room. We are opening at Film Forum March 22nd in New York City, so everyone should come. And we are going to be on PBS kicking off um, the POV season. Um, so it's really exciting that PBS is taking this on and we are making zero barriers to access to get this story. Just wanna say very quickly about where and how we shifted the focus. I wanted to make a story about rape that did not look at the survivor and the victim, that did not put the burden on the victim to tell the story and make people care, because that's not, that's 
very important, but really where we need to shift focus is on who is doing it, how are they doing it, why are they doing it, what are the institutions and systemic practices that are enabling it, and that is 100% what this film is about, and our outreach is to, you know, Everyone who wants the film, targeted especially to men and boys. I didn't make this film for women and survivors. I really made it for men and boys to take the baton, to go beyond allyship, to being an upstander. So in terms of storytelling, that really did inform the style and the tone of the film. It's hard hitting, it's a thriller, it's mystery that you piece together, and that's because I wanted people to stay in their seats, and especially men to be like, whoa, what's gonna happen? This is a, a thriller, so that was intentional. And I'm working with a lot of partners, uh, also not to finger wag at folks, but to inspire them. So I have a whole speakers bureau of men who are modeling positive masculinity, men who have been in this work for 15, 20 years, men who have been talking about toxic masculinity and rape culture for years. They join me on every panel, they join me at Tribeca, just to be like, oh, this is, I don't, the Women's Center is always welcome. We need people raising money to help them, and we need men talking to other men and young men about this topic. So that's that's really what we're doing, and we're getting great response. We're working with um, grassroots and all kinds of folks. That's it, and we have an, a beautiful, someone said gaming earlier. We are in the process of wrapping up um, an interactive game that's more focused sort of on bullying, but it's an, oper it's an experiential opportunity for young people to get involved in an experience and and look at peer pressure and how peer pressure fits into the narrative because that was such a big part of the culture in Steubenville. Um, yeah, and that's it. And that's the future right there. <laughs> okay.